यू आर लिसनिंग टू अ मिंट प्रोडक्शन प्रॉट टू यू बाय एच टी स्मार्ट कास्ट Hi welcome to Why Not Mint Money I'm Satya Suntanam from Mint's personal finance team In this podcast we have with us Gaurav Rastoki founder and CEO at Kuvera.in to talk about the 10 investment pitfalls one should avoid during their personal finance journey Let's get started Hi welcome to Why Not Mint Money a personal finance podcast where we help you understand basic money concepts and share strategies for you to build your wealth so let's get started on your money journey hello gaurav hi how are you i'm good satya how are you doing i'm good i'm good too thank you welcome to the why not mint money show um so before talking about the 10 investment pitfalls that you have uh, listed can you tell us how did you come up with the list first is it based on your personal experiences or based on your customers behavior so what's the genesis of it a mix of the two some of it is based on behaviors you have seen uh, across the world actually in investors uh, some of it is based on some of the behavioral biases which are also very well documented Um, the idea though was more around you know um, do you catch fish for a person versus teaching them to fish right so the thought was can we create almost like a construct that these are 10 different ways to think and that is true regardless of asset classes that is true regardless of you know um, what kind of investor you are you might be someone who's risk seeking you might be someone who avoids risks all the time but these principles or these pitfalls will apply to that investing style as well i understand so i think this is a good background for the whole conversation that we're going to have going ahead uh, so the first one that you talked about is uh, maintaining too much cash or cash equivalent uh, in one's portfolio so you said people keep too much of their wealth in cash or cash equivalent they also don't adequately increase investment amount as income rises uh how much of monthly income should one strive to invest after maintaining their obligations for the period cover right so that's a good question um and i would think of it in terms of your uh, kind of basic needs right the roti kapra or makan that we talk about so a good rule of thumb to follow is that once your essential obligations are being taken care of and you should have it anywhere from 6 months to 1 year of that amount in a very liquid form it could be a savings account it could be a short term fd it could be liquid funds but something where you can withdraw money like you know something happens you can withdraw money into pr um anything over and above that you should ideally invest for your longer term goals um it could be 3 years down the line 5 years down the line all the way up to retirement so instead of thinking it from a percentage construct it's much better to think of it in terms of um this is what i really want to spend on and it should be needs and wants so there is no reason to just spend on needs uh then i have 6 to 12 x of that money in a very liquid form and anything above that so if someone's just starting out um that percentage will be much lower because they have to build that emergency wealth but someone who's been working for 10 15 years that percentage could be as high as 30 40% so we i personally find this construct a much better construct than a flat percentage so the second point that you mentioned is people break their asset allocations regularly so you said that in bull markets they may even invest uh, in you know the invest the emergency funds in stocks and uh, while in bear markets they move too much to fts etc uh gauro i think it got to do with the behavioral aspect of an investor right so what behavioral aspect is being triggered here there is a whole um, greed and fear cycle that works in market in a bull market everyone is very confident people just kind of assume they're going to get that 20% per year return year after year after year with very little drawdown what you've seen in the last 3 4 years right markets have rarely corrected even 10% in the last you know few years so people get into this uh this mindset that equity markets always go up and always in a straight line and they start allocating a lot more to equity than they should given uh, you know what their goals are or given what their personality is then a bear market happens and suddenly um 
they are facing losses because you know they were 90 percent 100 percent in some cases they even invested their emergency funds in equity and they are facing mark to market losses they're down 40 percent 50 percent and suddenly the fear part of your brain lights up and it tells you that enough's enough i've lost enough money i can't afford to lose any more money so i'm going to move whatever is left to a very safe asset class and that safe asset class could be a fixed deposit, could be liquid funds, could be bonds, much safer than uh, an equity asset class, right? And both of these decisions are wrong. So the, the and, and effectively what happens is the wrong decisions you take in the bull market, which basically lets you to increase your equity asset allocation. It also sows the seed for the bad decision you will take in the bear market. If you were, Correctly, if you had, if you were a 60-40 investor, so 60% in equity and 40% in debt, and you kind of followed that to a bull market rally, then when the markets fall, your portfolio is not going to fall as much, and you are going to continue with your 60-40. So you'll keep on selling debt and buying equity as equity markets fall, right? which is the right behavior to do. Uh, but what we find is, especially greed is such a powerful motivator. Right? Bull markets create a lot of equity investors and bear markets destroy a lot of equity investors. And this is something that's been happening for, uh, you know, since the markets have been running in globally and in India. Um, and I would want people to kind of focus very clearly on what their asset allocation is and not break it regardless of whatever the, you know, the near past returns have been. Okay, so what is the ideal asset allocation do you think uh, suits so a young investor i know it could differ from person to person yeah maybe for a young investor who do not have any responsibilities as of now financial responsibilities in the near future so what do you think is the ideal asset allocation for that investor i would suggest that you know if you can't think of any other asset allocation just go with like a 75 25 75 percent equity 25 percent debt and I'm not saying there's any science behind it. It's just that you have reasonable invested in debt so that when markets turn south or when any kind of volatility hits, you are able to ride it out. But you're still getting the lion's share of equity market upside. Uh, other than that, you know, uh, talk to an investment advisor, use investment advisory tools online and figure out what's the right asset allocation depending on your goals and just follow that uh, with, with, with discipline. Uh, that brings me to the next point in your list, which talks about uh, that investors stop investing the first time they hit with large enough losses. Part of it is also how much are you prepared to lose, right? Which is where asset allocation also comes in. Um, if you are happy to lose 80% or if you think you're a kind of person who would be uh, who would be down mark to market 60 to 70 percent, but you would still continue to invest, then 100 percent equity is fine with you. So asset allocation in effect is not just about your age. It's not just about your goals. It's also about your risk taking ability as an investor. Right. Right. And that's that is why it is the most powerful tool to handle volatility right if you are a very risk averse investor right so 20 or 20 percent down and you are like oh my god this is not the right thing for me and you you would tend to actually cash out then it might turn out that even though you are 25 years old the right asset allocation for you would be like 30 to 40 percent in equity and 60 to 70 percent in debt just because you don't have the capacity to absorb that much risk. And that capacity could be different because of personality. That capacity could be different because of wealth levels. So what people don't realize is our ability to absorb losses is also largely dependent on our starting points. What do I mean by that, right? If you have two apartments and a very well-paying, two well-paying jobs and a side business, and your, uh, you know, your, your significant other has uh, employment as well. So effectively, you are you know, high net worth individual or an ultra high net worth individual. Your investments in the stock market are just a small portion of your overall portfolio. You're down 50%, 60%. It's not a life altering event for you. It is, it is significant, but not life altering. You're not going to get scared. You're going to be like, okay, I'm going to write this out. Now, on the other hand, if you have a limited bank balance, 
it's your first job and um, jobs are also you know pro cyclical so in down markets you're more likely to lose your job then suddenly for you uh, just because of your starting point you might not have the risk absorbing ability of someone same age as yours but in largely different circumstances so an individual has to understand this about where they stand to be able to kind of say that okay you know what if my portfolio was cut in half tomorrow i wouldn't blink an eye and i would continue investing that's the asset allocation where you should be like comfortable with um you know coming to the next investment pitfall that you mentioned um this point is really interesting you said that the biggest lever of uh, for wealth for most people is higher income 10 hours per week getting better at your job has a multitude higher return of uh then uh return then 10 hours per week researching and trading uh could you elaborate on that gaurav i mean this is actually a very simple one but people forget this a lot right uh, majority of the people that invest they invest from their savings the savings come from their income right if your income is growing really really fast you can save a lot more you can invest a lot more you can become richer faster right it's much harder to get disproportionately higher returns on investment right so if the market returns are 12 to 14% for say a 20 year period then it is there will be like a handful of investors literally like a handful of investors who will be able to get a 20% return on investment right so if you are one amongst the millions of people who are investing your odds of being that investor is really really low right but in india then and and globally also the labor market right which is your human capital it's valued on skills and earn and building that skill set can get you to a 10% increase in income or 15% increase in income fairly easily right and and we we see that all the time so if you can upskill yourself disproportionately the market is there where you can get paid 3x the average salaries to all the way up to 10x the average sal- salaries right especially in tech jobs um if you are the owner of the right skill set you can very easily be at the 5x median salary in like a few years right that kind of returns are almost impossible to get through investing especially uh, you know a lot of the uh, young people who are getting into the markets and who think that you know trading is something where they can make money easily first of all no one makes money easily on trading majority of traders will not even make fd returns forget like index fund returns right. so focus on your skill sets increase that pot of income wealth will come to you that's the that's the most simplest thing that people need to understand yeah yeah i think this becomes more important for a teenager right uh, i've read somewhere that you know for a teenager the best investment would be investing in their skill development as you just mentioned that would i think this was true earlier but i think uh, as our economies have become more knowledge based and decision based economies uh, even if you're in your mid 30s even if you're in your 40s um upskilling has become something which is so critical for every job true true but it's no longer um through that you know this is this only applies in the earlier part of your of your life and not the later i mean wage stagnation can happen at any time Right. what you don't want is that you don't want wage stagnation right gaurav i wanted to talk to you about another notion that is there um this this thing that uh, only business people can generate greater wealth and for job holders it's tough what's your take on that that's not true um and if you look at uh, actually if you look at the look at it very dispassionately from a statistical perspective uh business returns are what we call barbell returns okay uh, what that means is that um there will be 1000 people who will set up a business um 10 will become ridiculously rich the remaining 990 will be a dif- will be different levels of failure you will only hear about those 10 and you will think oh my god business makes everyone rich business i mean uh, startups businesses they have a very high rate of failure it's just that the failure doesn't happen in front of you um employment on the other hand which is labor labor on the other hand employment on the other hand has more of a bell curve it's a continuous distribution right so um 
extreme wealth is different than um, average wealth, right? Uh, if you want, if you're chasing extreme wealth, then yes, business is the right way to go. Equity ownership is the right way to go. But then the odds of failure are also disproportionately hard. If you're chasing um, average wealth, as in like, you know, you want to be a multi-millionaire, but not a gazillionaire, then employment is one of the easiest ways to get there. Brilliant, brilliant. Very nice way to put it, understand. Uh, so sticking to this concept of wealth, so one of the investment pitfalls that you mentioned is that uh, investors usually don't track wealth level returns. You said um, the profit and loss can be gamified to increase transaction volumes. So uh, can you elaborate on that? And can you also give some um, picture on how to track wealth? The idea here is very simple, right? Uh, what makes you wealthy at retirement is the overall level of your wealth. What you made on one stock, what you made on one trade, what you made on one transaction is absolutely immaterial in the larger scheme of things. Right? But um, specifically trading apps focus on how much you make on a transaction, how much you make on a trade, how much you make on a given stock, because it lights up the same parts of your brain as a video game. So that's why they say that trading is the ultimate gamification of investing. So, um, uh, and, and this is based on like uh, uh, a lot of neuroscience research on that, you know, when people are trading versus when people are playing video games. So, as an individual, if your goal is um, to brag about a trade that was 10x, then maybe a trading is the right thing to do. But if that position on that stock was only 0.5% of your overall wealth or 0.2% of your overall wealth and was also one of 10 positions, nine of the other positions are in losses, then that 10x actually got you nothing. Because it, it's like saying 0.5% of my wealth went up 10x and 4% of my wealth remained flat. So roughly, it's not like you made a huge amount of money. And tracking le wealth level returns and tracking portfolio level returns takes away this ambiguity, actually takes away this gamification. And so coming back to the investment pitfalls, um, so there's one very interesting and a funny one, which is you said, quote unquote, to treat anecdotes as data. And uh, you said you call it everyone want to be buffet uh, syndrome. You know, this is very similar to um, what you see and what you don't see. Kind of the example I gave about businesses, right? So you only see the successful business. So the perception is that it's easier to make money in businesses, right? This is very similar uh, in investing. Um, it happens in sports, it happens in like all the arenas, right? You, We lionize the winners. Uh, we talk about them, we single them out as exceptional individuals, we single them out as role models, we single them out as people to follow and we should. I mean, uh, at, a, at a behavioral level on how you should behave and how you should conduct yourself, we should. But we do it also at an outcome level that if we become like them, our outcome will be the same. Right. And that's where the randomness of the world comes in. Yeah, That's not going to happen. Right. This whole idea is fundamentally flawed there, right? So, uh, people look at anecdotes and they believe that they can be a Warren Buffett or they can be a Peter Lynch or they can be, you know, someone who's had a fantastic track record. Knowing fully well that there have been probably a couple of billion investors in the history of the world. And there have been only probably 10 names that have really, really outperformed the market. So the odds are fundamentally against you. Right. right. But um, part of it is that, you know, we want to be optimistic. Part of it is that we want to see the best outcomes for ourselves. And the point also is that sometimes this kind of information is also misrepresented like, oh, this is the strategy that Buffet follows. If you follow this strategy, you will become a Buffet. Um, no, even that is not necessarily true because what worked for Buffet in another era, the same strategies may not work for you in your era, right? So um, investing because it's so probabilistic in nature, a belief like this that you can become an outstanding investor like A, B, C or D 
can persist for a very long time and can cause real damage to your actual wealth and portfolio. That's one caution that investors should take note of. Yeah. Uh, so coming to the next investment uh, pitfall that you mentioned, past returns don't matter. The only predictor for future better returns is a lower cost structure. And you said a lot of sophisticated investors don't get this either. Uh, but Gaurav, you look at track record too of a fund or in case of mutual funds, uh, to get to get an idea of how they have actually performed uh, during the downturn how they have been able to manage the down cycle or how less volatile they are in generating returns. Don't you think past performance matters at all? Um, so the data is very clear about this. I mean, um, and across markets, across asset classes, the data is really, really clear, right? Like your last one year return, three year return, rolling returns, 10 year returns, sharp ratio, beta, you know, drawdowns, how do you handle down markets, who the fund manager is, who the fund house is, has little or no prediction on your future returns. Is that so? The only, the only, exactly. So, so the, the only factor that really has some correlation to longer term returns is how much you spend, your costs of investing, right? So if there is a manager who comes and tells you, hey, this is a thematic basket, last three years, the returns has been 30% per year but you will have to pay me, you know, 6,000 rupees per year or 10,000 rupees per year or pay me 1% per year to invest in this. Red flag, your costs are going up, your returns are not going up, right? Um, taxes is the other thing. I mean, you can bunch taxes as part of costs so you can think of it separately, but um, if you are in a strategy that churns a lot, has higher taxation, your returns are going to be lower. So when I when I when I say cost, it means anything that reduces your uh, take home return. Take home return is net of all your costs, right? Costs that are expense ratios are included in that. Um, research cost is included in that. Transaction costs, STTs, all of that is included in that. Um, thematic manager costs, PMS costs is all of that is included in that. And then taxes, right? Um, it's a short term strategy. You're paying 15% STCG, right? That's going to get included in that. So net net that is one of the biggest factors that has some statistical significance on how your long-term outcome is going to be and say suppose there's a fund which has underperformed in the last five to ten years big time yep. but it is actually having a very lower expense ratio low cost to it so do you think an investor will be better off investing in such a fund Generally, what happens is, um, and why this, why this plays out, why the data plays out like this, is because index funds have the lowest expense ratio. This is a very, this is a roundabout way of saying that almost any active strategy, almost any thematic basket strategy, almost anything that is being sold to you, will in the long run underperform the index because index have the lowest cost. And in India, an index fund, because mutual funds are tax advantaged, when a mutual fund churns its portfolio, it doesn't have to pay STCG or LTCG. While when your thematic fund master, th thematic fund uh, manager or your PMS manager, when they churn their portfolio, you have to pay STCG or LTCG, right? Because of these two huge advantages, this is just a, a different way of saying that in the long run, index funds will win. And that data is undeniable. And I'll tell you this also, there are absolutely no examples of a long-term active fund, which has lower expense ratios, which has underperformed. Active funds, even when they underperform, have very high expense ratios. It's because the cost of running that fund is high. Fine. Uh, with that, we'll uh, go to the next question, which is uh, uh, the next investment pitfall based on confirmation bias. You said they own, investors only seek information that confirms their beliefs instead of looking for non-conforming or missing data. So uh, for the benefit of listeners, uh, the tendency to process the information uh, by looking for or interpreting the information that is consisting that is consistent with one's existing beliefs is the confirmation bias. Now, Gaurav, tell us how to overcome this. This one's the hardest to overcome because it literally goes down to your fundamental beliefs. Right? Like I, I, 
one of the best examples of this is itc and and twitter right there are itc believers on twitter and there are people who don't believe in itc on twitter. i haven't seen anyone who has changed their mind yet and they'll keep on arguing all day long with each other i don't know who they are trying to convince themselves or the other side majority of the people because of um um because of social media this has actually gotten even more intense and the word that we use for it now is called an echo chamber right. so um confirmation bias is basically saying that i'll only seek data that will support my priors that will support my beliefs echo chamber is the next step where i will only hang out with people who have the same beliefs we'll keep telling each other how cool and how smart we are and none of us will actually bother that there might be a different opinion outside of our echo chamber which might also have merit and we will never seek it why i say that this is hard is because people have to make a conscious effort to seek non validating information and right. that is fundamentally hard for a lot of people it's much easier to say hey i like this stock hey i also like this stock great we are buddies than to say hey i don't you know i like this stock but i know that you don't like this stock can you tell me why you don't like this stock and then have a meaningful discussion and not just a you know raging debate on you are wrong you are wrong you are wrong because no one gains anything out of that um so this one's the hardest um, the easiest way to avoid this is of course uh not trade stocks but that's easier you know easier said than done and step and step uh now we come to the last uh, investment pitfall uh, as per uh, your list so you said that uh, investors usually mix uh, insurance and investing so this is one of the much talked about point in the personal finance that it shouldn't be done that way but uh, we also see the statistics where it is the much sold product in the market so what do you have to say about this cover up there's so much that's been said about this i would have thought that by now people would just run away from you know, any product that had investing and insurance um, in in financial services generally when two simple products are bought together to make a more complicated product the purpose of that product is only to increase the fees right um and products where you have insurance and investments mixed together the uh, the commission that the agent gets is humongous right it can be as high as 20% of your first few years premium or something like that i don't know what the actual numbers are but they are high um and all of that money is coming out of your returns right see when you're investing there is one cardinal truth that every investor should remember okay there is a huge ecosystem of investments there is an investor and there are a bunch of people who are trying to service that investor and promising him higher returns promising her uh, seamless transactions right so that's the service providers that service providers can be portfolio managers fund managers uh, thematic basket managers uh, trading platforms uh, everyone else the only person who puts money into that ecosystem is the investor yeah and your costs are everyone else's revenue right right it's a very simple fact but it creates pretty much all the conflicts that we see in the investing domain right so if a um if someone has to increase their revenues right the only way they can increase their revenues is by increasing your investment costs yeah. and we know that when you increase your investment costs your long term outcomes are not going to be that nice on average right investing in insurance is prime example of this you mix two products you increase the costs and then after some time people are like oh my god you know what my uh, th- this product doesn't have really good returns it barely beats anything right of course if you had bought that investing piece and insurance piece separately the cost would have been much much lower because you know term insurance is really cheap doesn't have the same levels of uh, payouts for the agents yes. index funds are really cheap doesn't have high expense ratios you reap the benefits of that reduced cost so this this is the this is the the, the if there is one thing you want to take away from this is that the investors cost is the revenue for the entire ecosystem if the ecosystem's revenue is going up 
as a collective lot of investors it's not good for you absolutely yeah yeah that's a brilliant way to put it kavra uh, um that's all we've come to the end of the uh podcast you know the thing i like about investing and personal finance is that uh, a lot of it is actually linked to your emotions like how we manage money is 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 very much linked to how we manage our emotions and uh, i believe that getting better at personal finance is getting better at handling our emotions and that's what i really like about personal finance and your session also talked a lot about how we can overcome the emotions which can actually not help wealth generation but destroy the wealth generation that's wonderful it's lovely to uh, catch up with you gaurav thank you so much for joining us thanks today. for thanks for having me here thank you thank you i'm just stopping this one that's all for now in this episode listeners if you have any queries or suggestions you can reach out to me on twitter my handle is at satya sontanam s a t y a s o n t a n a m or you can also write to us at mintmoney@livemint.com bye bye this was a mint production brought to you by hd smartcast hd smartcast